First, I'll declare the special meeting of Council of Tuesday, the 27th of April 2021 open. I advise that the special meeting of Council will be streamed live to the City of Adelaide website and the recording will also be published to the internet. Please note that an audio visual recording is being taken of this meeting. This means that your presence at and any contribution you make to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed or published publicly by the Council, including transfer outside Australia. Acknowledgement of country. Council acknowledges that we're meeting on the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pays respects to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land and acknowledge that they're of continuing importance to the Ghana people within today. We also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who are present today. Acknowledgement of Colonel William Light. The Council acknowledges the vision of Colonel William Light in determining the site for Adelaide and the design of the city with its six squares and surrounding belt of continuous parklands, which is recognised on the National Heritage List as one of the greatest examples of Australia's planning history. Heritage, my apologies. Um, apologies and leaves of absence. I changed my schedule, Lord Mayor, so uh, I can take that one. Thank out. you, Councillor <laughs> Um I did get a message from Councillor Hyde saying he'll be a few minutes late. Oh. No, Councillor Hyde. Oh. And no, I haven't right. heard from Councillor Kira. Sorry. No. Um, we have one item for consideration in confidence this evening. Um, so mm -hmm. I will seek a mover and a seconder for a motion, on, uh, uh, motion to order the exclusion of public for item 5.1.1, which is a CO update. I look for a mover. Thank you, Councillor mm -hmm. Abkinsday. Seconded, Councillor Knoll. Uh, members? Speak. If not, I'll go to the move of summer. Excuse me, will there be any two um, special council items? No, there's only one council room, which is the CO update. I think they postponed the. Uh, so the city access, I think that's been postponed to next week. Yeah. No, it's a two enabling priorities yeah. and a strategic plan. No. This is that was on the original. So the original, I know, me, but on the original um, agenda notification, there was one meeting such as this. Only in the last hour has come in this one. Uh, no, this one was published uh, a couple of hours ago. Yeah, but when yeah. they got it last week, this was not. It was correct. Another correct. One. That's been so moved to, to next week. Causing priorities, which. But, Oh, that's, yeah. that's the right. uh, presentation. Yeah, so, so that's the uh, presentation to follow this. So the committee meeting will follow this. We've put the presentation, the presentation into the committee meeting as a presentation. Because it's a standard. We made that really clear. Um, so we walk into this room knowing exactly what we're going to be talking about. It. And could we also describe them in better terms? Strategic partnerships and neighbouring priorities. I mean, what, what on earth does that mean? That's been dealt with in committee. Can we make it easier? Sorry, I thought it was the other special that we move on. Okay, members will move on. And um, thank you, that's taken uh, an undertaking. I will need a vote. Members to vote. Those in favour, those against, that is carried. Um, we will shut the door. Any participants not associated with.
of the committee will be streamed live to the City of Adelaide website and a recording will also be published to the internet. Please note that an audio and visual recording is being taken of the meeting. This means that your presence and any contribution made to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed or published publicly to the Council, including transferring outside of Australia. Council acknowledges that we are meeting on traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pays respect to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. We acknowledge that they are of continual importance to the Ghana people living today. And we also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who are present today. Any apologies today? I'll cancel him today. Okay. Apologies, Councillor Abraham today, and I suspect the Lord Mayor would come back in. Um, I now seek a mover and a seconder to move the minutes of the meeting of the committee held on the 6th of April 2021 to be taken as read and confirmed as accurate record of the proceedings. Councillor Canal, Seconder, Councillor Kira, try to speak to one. Those in favour? Those against, motions carried. Um, right, so today we have uh, discussions on the city and economic insights. And today we are being presented by Leandro, but first we will have Tom to um, give us the uh, preamble. Thank you, presiding member. Thank you, elected members. Uh, the purpose of today and moving forward is to actually provide you with what we regard as very good data that actually uh, shows and reflects how the city is performing in regards to pre-COVID, during the COVID period, and how it's actually coming through in regards to recovery. Um, what you may do is you may focus on some of the numbers which are slightly down, but it is important to note the city is recovering. There is a lot of things that are being done very, very well. So, for instance, if you look at the Goodrich Street and Growth Street, a uh, major redevelopment to be happening with the Central Market Arcade. If you look at the North Adelaide, you look at 88 O'Connell Street. Um, if you look at development within the city, there's a lot of major development happening in the around the city. Um, also, uh, AIDA are working very closely with Renew Adelaide. Um, there's a lot of interest in the work that they've been doing, and uh, uh, AIDA will be coming back in May to actually tell you what they are doing, and also with a, a further report and a workshop to actually say what are the levers to actually move the city forward. So what I'm going to do is hand over to Leandro. He's really captured the data, and if you can give us a couple of minutes, he'll go through it and whatever, and then if there's any questions, uh, please, by all means. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for having us here tonight. Um, I'm going to start going through a few global trends uh, and to highlight some of the things that have, are happening across the world that are having an impact on how things are going and especially how things are quite changing uh, during this time. And then I, I'm going to drill down into some specifics on the impacts of Adelaide. And I think it's probably important to understand that we are not covering all the, all the impacts tonight, but we are probably addressing some that uh, are quite relevant for the current state of, of the economy. So basically just the purpose for tonight then to present uh, insights and which highlight current data and trends associated with city's performance. So let's start with some global trends. This is um, a study that McKinsey uh, um, undertook globally, and it's basically a survey that they conducted of 5,000 across almost 5,000 employees who work in corporate and government settings. And basically, what this is showing us is how most employees would prefer a more flexible working model, and it shifted from probably 30 percent. Uh, preferring a more hybrid working model, working model pre-COVID to almost 52%. So that's a big shift. And this is, again, globally from a survey they conducted uh, all across the globe. And when we see, when we look actually uh, at, the, at the data in more detail, we see that Australia has been actually one of the countries that has uh, responded more strongly to this uh, these flexible working arrangements. 
Um, and then when we actually go into what the Property Council of Australia um, conducted with Ernst & Young uh, early this year, this, uh, this research around uh, city, business, city experience districts, and they found that 70% of city workers want to continue working flexibly. And they actually found that 3.3 days in the office would be the average preference. It's still a recognition that cities and cities in particular will, will be important in the future, but there's also an understanding that uh, it will not be as busy following COVID-19. So this, this is quite relevant for us and to understand that the, the current flexible work arrangements that we are seeing and how companies are implementing this across the world due to COVID is probably here going to stay in the longer term. Next is this concept of localization. Um, basically, what we have seen over the last 12 months is how people is spending more time around their, their home, and this, in, in, in particular, due to these working from home arrangements, people are spending more time, spending more money in the local area, and this will significantly is having an impact on the city. Um, anecdotally, we have heard from some of the suburbs that uh, they have had an increase in sales during COVID, uh, while we in the CBD have, have seen uh, a strong dip in, in sales. So this idea of localization is something that we need to be aware of, and especially for our population growth agenda as well. This is a picture from Vienna, um, and this is showing how quickly some cities have actually moved into retaining public space, and especially, I think in particular in, in Europe, uh, where COVID has been quite significant, especially in the early months, and it, it had triggered uh, a strong response, in, especially around public spaces, with the importance of the uh, people spending time outdoor. And uh, so on the left, we can see a, a picture from 2019, and on the right, uh, a completely different public space in 2020. I'm going to go quickly through this, uh, just to mention some others that um, we think are quite relevant. First of all, regionalization. Uh, as you have probably heard from, especially for cities like Sydney or Melbourne, where people, especially commuting, is, is quite significant in a daily daily workers, for daily workers, so people is looking more at the regions to live in the regions, and nowadays with technology enabling people to work from home, um, is this ten tendency to regionalization. So people are spending more time in the regions as well, and especially in bigger cities where commuting is a significant part of the day, people is just choosing to, to live probably outside the cities and only coming to the cities for one or two days in the week. Then the green agenda, sustainable investment, we have seen a lot of investment globally in green projects. Um, I remember a few months ago uh, listening to a webinar where the former mayor of London was talking about green finance and speaking about the trillions of dollars that were available globally for green projects. And this is something that, again, with the impacts of climate change, is something that will uh, keep growing. So it's, a, it's one of those global trends that we still, we really need to keep an eye on. The changes from business travel and tourism, especially in business travel with international border restrictions, um, business travel and with the, with the changes in technology, now people is getting used to um, participating in conferences online. This is certainly having an impact here, but also globally. And similar with tourism, um, some experts are not expecting to go back to the same levels uh, that we had in tourism until at least 2024. So there's still a long way to go. Social and emotional impacts, we, we know that uh, this last year has been uh, quite challenging for a lot of people, uh, especially in places where COVID has uh, impacted uh, much stronger than here, um, especially around mental health, mental health issues. 
is something that we, we, we certainly need to be aware. Retail and online and omnichannel growth, we, we are going to talk a bit more about this later, but how retail has been impacted by COVID is significant. Uh, and the, this idea that you can now buy anything online and get it delivered to your home, that's, that's definitely going to stay. But also the omnichannel growth and how you actually nowadays do a lot of research online and then you probably go to the shop just to pick up uh, your and <laughs> the things that you you purchase the experiential and the the craving for experiences from people people is is, is still looking for and that reconnection with with the the loved ones and, and that's something that is definitely going to be a trend especially over the, once we we sort out the the health the health aspects of this the current crisis the acceleration of the fourth industrial revolution Basically, it's something that was already happening, but with the with the changes and the uh, especially with the changes in technology over the last few uh, the, over the last few years, and COVID has just accelerated this this change. And finally, in terms of global trends, the impacts on the education system, um, distance and online learning. We we do know that most universities across the globe have had to jump into online for for their courses and currently all universities across the world are reviewing their business model and looking at how they can actually um, navigate the the future of the education system so now we're going to be focusing a bit more on the city and first first of all we're going to look at city visitation this is data from 60 sensors that we have um, across the city and basically what this data is showing um, the two lines the purple line 2019 the pink one is 2020 and this is the total number of detection of devices um, per, per week so basically what we can see here is uh, that last year so it's, yes last year um, French time was probably one of the best that we had, and we know that because we, it was also uh, a year that was record on sales. But then this is how significantly the city was impacted in the initial lockdown. Slowly recovered, we never got back to where we were in 2019. And what we can see here is the three-day lockdown in November. So, first of all, what we need to understand is the, and we probably do understand, is the impact that um, lockdowns have in our city in terms of people coming to the city. And now we are looking at the first six months of the year. The, we have the two, the two lines again, but then the blue line is 2021. Now, there's some positives here. First of all, even though we are still under the levels we had in 2019 and 2020, it has recovered quite nicely for the first quarter of the year, especially when we compare this with some of the data we have seen for other capital cities. Now, probably one of the worrying things is how this blue line has come down again. We understand that there is also an impact here of um, the um, long weekends, the um, school holidays as well, yes, and Easter. So we do know that we, we always knew that there were there was going to be a dip here, but we are still not seeing the recovery that we probably wanted to see. And, and this is data up to last week. So I actually updated this this morning. So probably your slide will be slightly different uh, for this line. Um, but this is something that we need to understand and probably one of the pieces of data we are going to be using moving forward to, especially because we have really good data as a baseline, we have data up to 2019, so we have three years worth of data. And then here, I'm going to do a slightly different analysis. What we are seeing here is different days of the week. And the three columns are the three different quarters, the, the three different first quarters for the last three years. So the first column would be 2019, January to March. Second column, 
January to March 2020 on the third column, the first quarter of this year. And this is the number of detections for daytime, so from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. We can say that we have seen an average of a drop of 5% in the number of detections for that first quarter during daytime. Now, when we go into the nighttime, the picture is a bit different. We have seen a drop in 20%, but then when we look at Friday and Saturdays, the drop is of 30%. And this is quite significant for our nighttime economy. So it, it is really, um, it is recovering much slower than daytime visitation. And, and in particular for Fridays and Saturdays, that are probably the two biggest days for the nighttime economy. Again, we are going to keep, tra keep tracking this over the next few months, and we are going to come back with, with new data soon. But uh, I think it's very important for us to understand that this first quarter, even though it was positive, it is different. It, it, the, the impacts have been different at different times of the day but also different areas of the city. So I won't drill down tonight on specific areas of the city, but that's something that we can look at. And when you start looking at the different areas, we know that the impact has been different. Leandro, yeah, that would be mainly due to the restrictions though, in terms of numbers. Correct. Into clubs or... Yes, that's, that's, a, that's what our assumption is. Yes. So as we keep tracking into this quarter, we should see that move. Hopefully, yes. Sorry, um, I guess the other thing we need to bear in mind is because it is 6 p.m., we here we haven't broken down to evening and night economy. So as you get more detail around that, you can see the difference around those people who've been in the city and staying for dinner versus those people who are coming in for nighttime activities. Thank you, sorry. I'd like to ask a question. Lord yeah, that's fine. Um, I'm confused though, when it, Lord Mayor pointed out, was that the restrictions? But am I reading that right? That the pink is this year where there have been far less restrictions, no lockdowns, and the aqua is last year where there were massive restrictions and lockdowns. I can't understand why we're, we're doing work because uh, the, so the orange one was not when COVID was hit very hard. The aqua in the middle was when COVID had really hit us between the eyes. No, I guess we didn't shut down until the 22nd of March. Okay. Yeah, really. Why are we using this? Because well, it's because the that's the only yeah. Okay, but Stan, still, um, the aqua is doing pretty well then, but that's a bit forward. They weren't on the shutdown. It does pretty well through all of that graph, though, Stan. The pink is where this, am I reading right? Pink is this year where we've had no lockdowns, uh, the restrictions have mainly been lifted. Why, what's the explanation for that? The worst year should be the actual year, shouldn't it? So, so through the so through the chair, I might just answer that. So, what's really important about this data set is it's the first quarter. So, we didn't actually have any lockdowns or any um, changes until March and late in March. And we also, it's an average over the whole of that quarter. Let's not forget also that um, March we had the biggest um, fringe event. Um, and festival season that we've ever had. So the, the two last weeks in March last year were offset by the earlier part of March being much higher. So the, the orange and the blue are more standard. What we're seeing this year um, is a reduction. Um, as the Lord Mayor had mentioned, part of that, not all of it, but part of that is because there has still been restrictions, say on nightclubs and things like that as well. What more restrictions this year than last year? Compared this to the first quarter. This, that was before COVID last year. It's, it's March. Look at the time. Yeah, actually, I had on the 22nd of March. I still don't know that. I still don't know that. Yeah, let, let me try it for the party. Before COVID. Let me just clarify then that the first two columns correspond to the first one to 2019, the second one to 2020, but only for the months from the 1st of Jan to the end of March. So that means that for the first two columns, we wouldn't see any impact of COVID or any impact of any restrictions. That's why the first two columns look quite similar. 
um, but the, the pink column, the third column, is actually for this first quarter of this year. So that's why that was the only column that would show the impact of some, some type of restrictions or the impacts of COVID-19 as well. But we had restrictions in the first quarter of last year. No, because we it was only the the third week of March where the federal government started to impose some restrictions. Right. So this really isn't that helpful at all then, because there were no restrictions in the, restrictions in the first two columns. So no, we're not so really bringing in for I think the, the only the only thing probably that I could mention here is that the importance of this of this chart is to show how things were pre-COVID yeah. and how things are now that we are navigating COVID-19 situation. So that's why the two columns again look at what the, the, the state of the economy before COVID. But we, we, we can we, we will come back again in the next quarter with more detailed analysis from this and I think you will find it quite quite useful to see the changes over time on, on the visitation in the city at different times of the day as well. So I will jump into city spend now and I will be brief on this one but basically the, the blue line is showing um, expenditure in the city and the, the red line is showing expenditure at the state level. And the blue line corresponds to the axis on the left and the red line axis on the right. So basically what this is showing us is that the impact of COVID-19 in spending in the city was much significant than the impact that we can see at the state level. And that's basically because a lot of people was then buying their grocery, their groceries closer to home and they were not spending time and money in the city. Um, and then we can see how spending the city has recovered quite nicely towards the end of last year. This data is up to January this year. And we, we can see again how in January, the actual blue line is starting to be again above the red line. So this is probably one of those positive um, uh, charts that we would like to see more moving forward. Could I just ask what, that's a COVID graph, obviously, COVID spending. No, this is spending in general across the whole economy. This is from SpendMap. It's a tool that looks at uh, data from bank transactions, so card transactions. I guess what Council Moran is asking is that has COVID affected any of that in that graph? Yes, correct. Here, so when we look at the graph, this is data from July 2018 up to January 2021. Yeah. So this dip here, this is from April 2020. So that was when the initial lockdown was announced in LA. That other dip would be November shut. That's correct. Then going into Macy's vacancy rates, and we do this quite regularly. We are trying to update every every main street, every quarter. So I know this looks very busy and it's hard to read on the screen, but I will navigate through it quickly. Basically, we have seen a, an average vacancy rate of 30% across the city, 13%, sorry. And then when we look at the, these are the main streets that we have audited. So Melbourne Street, Hundley Street, Goodger, Hadley, <coughs> O'Connell and Randall Street. And in September 2020, we were this 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 line here shows what the vacancy rate was, and then at the moment we can see that Randall Street, for example, has had an increase in vacancies. It's only one point, but in a small in a in a small street um, like Randall Street, you can you, you can feel the difference. Then when you have O'Connell remains. Uh, at the same level, same for Hindley. Gutcher has had a slight, a small improvement, and this is also due because mm -hmm. to some of the shops in September were actually closed, but they open again. It's the same shop that has opened again now that um, that the situation has is better in, in general terms. Hull Street remained the same. Melbourne has decreased slightly again. But one thing that is consistent across all the streets is that we have seen significant turnover of businesses. 
So businesses that have closed and have opened. Um, and that's probably uh, important to understand as well. Um, so hopefully for the next analysis that we will bring in the next quarter, we will probably drill down a bit more on that because it's important to understand also the changes in, in the, the, the businesses, not only the number of business, but the type of business that uh, has opened and closed in those streets. Retail train. So basically here what we wanted to highlight is the market share of online retail sales in SA has increased to 16.7% and this is from up to December 2020. And that's a 32% growth year over year. To put things on perspective, when you look at the market share of online retail sales in the UK and in the US, um, there's still a lot of room for growth for online in terms of online sales. We also know that there are some special um, limitations here, especially around logistics. Uh, it's, it's not, and, and because of the size of the market, um, but still, we expect this number We still keep growing. It will not stay at 16.7%. And the other important comment here is how probably uh, the random mall, um, random mall has lost more market share than the suburban um, shopping centers to online. Quickly jump into tourism. Again, some high level figures, but basically we have seen a huge drop in visitation. I'm just looking at domestic tourism here. We are not looking at international tourism because um, we understand how uh, border restrictions have had an impact in, in international tourism. But even when we look at domestic tourism, and this is that up to December last year, we, have, we can see here a huge drop in visitation from interstate. So this is very important for us to understand that we, even though we, when we look at the numbers of city visitation and from the device counters, we are actually only 15% down. We still, under, there's a big number of visitors that we are not getting from interstate. So those num most of those numbers are from uh, Adelaide and South Australians. The other comment I would like to make here is we actually, there was some information released on January from Tourism Research Australia on some monthly snapshots that they produce around tourism. And one of the key insights from that was that Adelaide metro area, it was down approximately 30% in terms of expenditure, tourism related expenditure, but the regions were up, I think it was around 9%. So again, we, we are seeing this difference in how the regions are performing and how the city and the CBD environment is performing as well. So I think you have the slides, but I, I will ask the question anyway. What do you think this number is? We read ahead. <laughs> so it's the number of parking bays in the city. And basically, we thought that it was important to show you because um, the number of parking bays in the city is significant. And when we look at the split, we see Off Street, it's around 20,000, U Park, around 6,000, On Street Pay, 3,000, Unpaid, 10,000, and we have also a number of restricted access, but overall, more than 40,000 parking bays in the city. That is incredible, Andrew. It's a big number. It is big. The, I know there is more information coming on parking uh, in the next few meetings, so I won't drill down into this, but uh, we just thought it was important for us to understand that there's a big number of parking bays in the city of Hollywood. Just, just on that point, why? Yeah, what's, I'm not saying the relevance of this present, but more particularly, Shouldn't the relevant issue here be the cost of parking relative to other providers outside the city? I'm curious as to why that element is excluded from just a basic here are the number of parking spaces. I don't, I don't get what the relevance is. Basically, basically the objective with this was to show, because in comparison with other cities, we understand that the number of parking bays is much higher than what we can see 
based on the size of the city and the number of, of people that live in the city and visit the city every day. Uh, so that's why we, we thought it's important to show this information. Because we, we really as important. I said before, there will be uh, more more data coming through in the next few meetings. I don't remember the exact date, but I think it's in the next one or two meetings. You're going to have a whole analysis on parking across the city. Kaslan. Um, and just as well, I think when we're looking at this, we need to also look at our occupation data about new parks, which, as I understand it, are pretty full um, as well, but that's just anecdotal evidence. Um, uh, and furthermore, as well, I think you can't actually look at this in isolation and compare it to another city unless you also take into account the trips per day in South Australia, which is 85% of every trip that happens in this state happens in a car. I'd love to see that pitted again. So if you're going to put this up there and say that, then you need to put Melbourne trips per day, how many car parks they have in their city as well. You can't just cherry pick. You need to, I don't look, I'm not sure what your expertise is, a data scientist perhaps, but if we're going to do it, that's my advice to the, to the, to the administration. If you want to have a meaningful comparison, you need to look at, yes, total car parking days, but also trips per day, how they travel, um, and then uh, the, the population as well. You can't just, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Leandro um, is a, a suitably qualified um, researcher, just to be clear. He's not cherry picking data for you tonight. Uh, the purpose of tonight is really to show you the types of insights and data that are um, that uh, show where the city is at now. And really this is um, to enable members to reflect and think about what some of the priorities might be in the coming months. So for example, with parking, I think the key insight from this is around the accessibility that our um, city has for people who we know predominantly drive into the city. So I wouldn't be taking much more away from, um, from tonight around parking um, other than that. Um, and as Tom mentioned right at the start, um, we are developing a growth and investment strategy based on a resolution uh, decision from council members back in uh, December. Um, and this is a precursor to enable you to have some information and data as input into that when we bring that back to you on the 18th of May. Thank you. Um, I will now quickly go through the numbers of JobKeeper just to keep things in perspective. As of September last year, there were 3,878 businesses that applied for JobKeeper in the city of Adelaide. And the second phase, January this year, 1,400. We still don't know um, what the impact of the ending of JobKeeper in 28th of March uh, will be. Um, but I think it's important to remember that there was a big number of businesses in the city that had to apply to JobKeeper. Some employment trends. Here, this is probably uh, one of those good stories. And um, basically, the shaded area shows the impacts of the seasonal impacts of, of summer in job advertisements. But um, the important part here is even though we saw a big dip in July 2020, it has recovered. We still don't know the composition of those jobs. And anecdotally, we know that the, um, some of the comments are about these, most of these jobs being uh, short term or even being casual to attend some of the, again, the seasonal impacts of, of uh, fringe, for example. But nevertheless, it's still a very, uh, a very good picture that we can see here. Job seeker, and this represents the number of people who are eligible rec recipients of job seeker allowance and youth allowance. And to be eligible for job seeker, which replaced New Start allowance in March last year, participants must be unemployed and looking for work. So, again, in terms of the impacts in the city, and, see, and this is particularly in city residents for the first point, we, we see that there has been an increase in the number of job seekers. Same for um, the whole greater ally and South Australia as well. Number of workers by industry sector. Basically here, my objective would be to look at the 
at the top sectors here. When we look at public administration safety, professional scientific and technical service, and especially education and training and finance, all these sectors are probably those that are more, um, that flexible work arrangements are more feasible. Now, those are the biggest employers in the city. So when we talk about the global trends and the, the changes in the, in the um, in work arrangements, we need to understand that that is having an impact on the city, and especially because when we look at the biggest employers, are all in these sectors. And these are the, this is the growth that some of these sectors have experienced. And even when you look at education and training, you see a uh, big growth in, in the last five years. But again, we, we know that this might change in the near future. This is um, data from the Property Council of Australia. So this is the outcome of a survey that they conduct monthly. And basically what this is showing us is that 71% um, that 71 is the level of occupancy in office buildings self-reported by property council members. Um, but when we put things into in perspective here, we see the big differences, especially with Melbourne and Sydney, and when they are only back to Melbourne 35 and Sydney to 50%, we had 71%, when the maximum here would be probably around 84% based on the current vacancy rates, but it still has recovered quite um, nicely if we compare with the other capital cities. Then jumping into the economic output, and basically here what we are analyzing is the value added by industry sector. And what I wanted to highlight here is what are the actual economic drivers of our city in terms of uh, industry sectors. And we, we, we see here how there has been significant growth in professional scientific, healthcare, and information media and telecommunications. And that's actually a very good story for the city. That in the last five years, there has been growth in these sectors. And what, what we highlighted here is the um, sectors that the state government has a focus on. And we also understand that this is quite relevant for us to align our agendas and trying to look at <clears throat> what are the sectors that the, the state is having a focus on and what are the sectors that are important for our city economy. A lot of development is still happening in the city. Again, this is one of those positive stories. We do have investment from the public sector, but we also do have significant investment from the private sectors. There has been a number of hotels that have come into the market in the last two years, and there are more in the pipeline. And then when we jump into residential growth, first of all, here, this is data from um, the rental market and basically how the vacancy rate has changed over time. We can see the initial impacts of COVID here in the rental market. It has improved a bit, but we are still seeing a high vacancy rate. And uh, what, what would we consider a high vacancy rate in the city? And again, this is based on rental uh, in the rental market. You're talking about residential or commercial? Books? This is residential only, yes. Anecdotally, we have heard from some real estate agents also that some of the apartments have actually been closed since March last year from some international students that have flown back home and the apartment have been closed the whole time with all the, the things in there and still paying the rent, but the apartment closed. So that's very important to understand as well when we look at the city visitation in particular areas of the city where in the areas where international students live, we have seen a drop, uh, more, um, a bigger drop in the city visitation as well. So that talks about the impact of our international students in our city economy as well, from a day-to-day -day spending. This number is the median price of a unit for February for the city of Adelaide. And we wanted to put this number up because again, putting things in context, when we compare this with the value of a unit in Melbourne, in Sydney, 
we do understand that this number is quite much, is much more affordable. And when we are talking about regionalization, we need to also understand that Adelaide is considered for a lot of people uh, in Australia still as the regions. Mm -hmm. And we need to understand that that concept of regionalization could have a positive impact in our city as well. One of the key drivers of population growth is migration. And probably the, the comment here is when we look at the number of people that have come from overseas, it's significant, it's quite big. And when we look at the current state of the borders, and we need to understand that, that we have a, a longer, a, a, a big impact in the longer term for, for our city population growth. <clears throat> And this is a different analysis in migration, but this is interstate migration. Again, what this number is showing us is that we, the negative net migration is basically saying that we are losing more residents to our suburbs um, than we probably would like to. This is it. Um, basically, next steps, Tom will go through that. Through your presiding member, thank you, Leandro. Um, what we aim to do with this data is bring it back on a quarterly basis. Uh, it will be interesting to see next quarter because naturally we will be comparing to when COVID was really rife in regards to the second quarter of the calendar year compared to this year. So you would hope that actually see a significant improvement. Um, the other thing that we'll be doing is bringing back on the 18th of May, as the acting CEO has indicated, uh, we're going to bring back an economic levers and growth agenda, which will talk to what we're doing, but also where the opportunities are in regards to the city, where the growth levers are and what we can actually look at if we wish to actually tackle it. And that's also looking at uh, the increase in building stock as well and what it does to rates and all the associated revenue opportunities. So we will be bringing that back and that will be with the administration and AIDA will be available on the 18th to present to elected members. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next item, um, 4.1, we have the North Adelaide Golf Course Future Planning. Um, we have Sean presenting, but Tom, you got to be able to this one as well? Thank you, President Member. I'll keep, keep this brief. Um, for, for elected members, some elected members would be aware that in 2018 we undertook a draft master planning for the Gulf Links. Um, that, that was a very aspirational master plan which came with a significant cost. Tonight, uh, rest assured, we're not presenting a 50 to 60 million dollar cost to elected members. What we want to do is be able to present what uh, is actually happening within Gulf, where the opportunities are where the uh, quick wins are and where we can actually focus our energies. Um, I think it's really important to understand that uh, since COVID, golf has become the COVID sport, outdoor sport for socially distancing, and it's doing extremely well, whereas prior to COVID, it was in major recession. Uh, but now golf links around, uh, around Australia are doing extremely well. So I'll hand over to Sean. Thank you. Thank you, um, through the chair, and thanks, Tom, for the lead in. Um, so tonight we are seeking views on progressing an iterative facilities development plan to extract the potential from North Adelaide Golf Course. And we're also seeking some views to progress a detailed planning for mini golf as a first element of that step. Um, so very briefly on the history, the existing master plan um, was originally formulated in 2018, as Tom mentioned, and was presented to council. A cultural heritage assessment was completed, but additional works required in line with the recommendations um, of the report. And a review of the master plan has been completed to realign with the objectives of the strap plan and the existing operating environment. Um, just really briefly on the existing operations, you can see our year on year rounds are significantly higher, and that is primarily due to the sport, um, as Tom mentioned, increasing popularity through COVID. Um, and of course, important consideration regarding the change since 2018 when the master plan was developed is, is really the quality of the courses, which has significantly improved over that period. Uh, we're project projecting a moderate surplus this year and we're continuing to focus on long-term sustainability and customer retention, obviously with the boom that's, that's happened. The significant achievement this year is that we're projecting to be 600k favourable in comparison to the average five-year position, which is great. 
Um, probably an interesting benchmark just included is the 800K to maintain it as parklands. Um, the course is around about 12% of the total parklands that are maintained by council. Um, and the purpose of this figure is just to challenge the simplicity of looking at the five year operating loss in isolation of the context um, of the parklands and the activation on the parklands. So um, as we move through the presentation of the future, the three key takeaways probably about the current um, operations is really that the course quality is significantly different um, and is far closer to being fit for purpose today than 2018 when the master plan was developed. The participation equals sustainability, and I think this slide fairly well shows that by increasing our participation and our financial sustainability um, objectives have somewhat been met. And the financial sustainability isn't as simple as focusing on service or deficit alone in context of parklands and activation. So if we just take those three key pieces from this slide on the way through, that's probably um, a good result. I'll just skip through. Um, so for those that aren't familiar, um, these are our three 18-hole golf courses that we've got um, as part of a standard operation. So this is the existing facility. So this slide shows the entire of the 2018 master plan. I understand it's quite busy on the screen, but um, obviously probably easier to read in the packs that we shared prior. Um, I'll briefly take members through the staging that was suggested. I just note that we're really providing this as background and we're pretty conscious that um, members in the room wouldn't necessarily have seen this master plan in full details as presented to prior, prior council. Um, so whilst it's not the suggested path forward in its current form, uh, I think it's just important that we provided the context and the history about um, the overall development as it's started. Um, and I just mentioned as well, if we need to come back with more information or clarity or questions from, from the workshop tonight, we'll obviously do that and provide any other additional information that's needed. Um, so stage one was a proposal for mini golf to occur down by the par three and also a reconfiguration of the par three. So that's the purple section at the top. Um, so it does reduce the hole slightly to enable space for the mini golf development to occur. And the other section is um, down by Wall Memorial Drive, which is a um, driving range. So the second stage is the sort of considerable body of work and that involves constructing a new clubhouse down by the riverbank, which isn't um, in purple, but it's this section just down here. Um, and it also includes 13 holes being um, redeveloped on the south course. Um, so for those that aren't golfers, golf is 18 holes. So it's not a complete redevelopment in this phase of the south course. You end up with, um, with only the 13 holes. Mm -hmm. So the final stage um, is five new holes to be completed on the south course and a six hole executive course operating up in the north, um, sort of closest to the park near the, the aquatic center. Um, and just to be really clear, the proposed mini golf location is down by the path right in front of the existing facility that's there. Uh, as mentioned, a review has been completed and we're uh, proposing to come back to council with an iterative facilities development plan as opposed to, to um, continuing with that master plan. As you can see, the development's incredibly significant and the costs um, are significant with it, being 50 to 56 million. Um, if I can just alert everyone, these are very high level cost estimates, cost estimates provided on a QS basis. So they are very, very high level based on the drawings that you've seen. So it's not um, to be taken, I guess, as, as firm, but I think it gives a really good representation of the associated cost of the full development. Um, and just really quickly wanted to mention car parking because we, we generally do. Um, <laughs> the proposal included an undercroft car park and a new, uh, and a new clubhouse down the riverbank. That portion of the riverbank holds a fairly significant importance to the Kana community. Um, golf is unique for car parking insofar as we do need to carry clubs and other modes of transport are quite challenging for the sport. Um, providing car parking facilities for golf uh, is consistent with the CLMP, but I think uh, future planning needs to be more considerate as to what options are available to solve the parking problem, if you will, as opposed to, to that site, that location, and the, the significance of it um, is certainly consistent through the, the cultural heritage assessment, I think, probably moving forward. Um, Slide. So very briefly, a strategic review of the business has highlighted that there's great alignment between North LA Golf Course existing services and the strategic plan of council. So we're particularly um, seeking to provide great experiences, improve health, and obviously improve the financial position of the council. I won't go through this, um, but strategic priorities now guide the decision making of North LA Golf Course. And as I mentioned earlier, 
um, really participation in equal sustainability, and that's why they're our two um, priorities moving forward. This slide explains what we're going to do. It's worth noting that we've deliberately distilled it down to two success factors, which is 90,000 rounds of golf on the parklands, and we want to be in a cash positive operation um, as per this year. Sorry, did you want to interrupt? No, no. 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 Sure, I'm almost there. Um, the iterative facilities development plan we're seeking to put together has no less than four bodies of work and I expect that they're probably far more highlighted um, independent bodies of work as we move through the journey. Um, certainly the first three shown in that last dot point on the screen are significant decisions in regards to the location of a driving range and the redevelopment or replacement of the clubhouse, um, probably leaning towards um, doing a refit and redevelopment there. Um, for context, high level feasibility has been completed on the mini golf um, component we're putting forward, um, and it is expected um, that the investment required for that phase will be somewhere in the vicinity of one to $1.5 million with the return on investment of two to five years. So that's sort of 20 to 50% return on capital investment, just as why we're sort of progressing that mini golf with some urgency as opposed to the broader context. I think that probably wraps up for me. Um, proposed next steps are to engage Golf Australia to provide um, some industry expertise and they'd offer their support um, to assist and I would like to um, thank them for their support in reviewing the master plan. Um, obviously, as I said, progressing specifically with mini golf opportunity in the par three area, looking to develop that concept plan a little bit further with Golf Australia and the Ghana consultation to inform that design as opposed to the design coming first and um, also the development of the facilities um, development plan to provide council the insights to the iterative um, manner to move forward. So that's it, I'll pass back to the chair and um, take questions. Thank you. I have, sorry, I have uh, Councillor Kieran. Thanks, Chair. Um, uh, it's been stated that this uh, proposal, the stages would take place um, on the basis that each stage is profitable, or each stage adds or pays for itself essentially. Um, can we get more detail on how that <coughs> profitability is envisaged with respect to stage one, the mini golf and uh, that stuff? That's the most immediate one we're all considering. Um, can we? I assume that's probably part of what you're going to deliver, but it would be good to see uh, what the basis of the profit estimates are so that we can understand you know, and have some confidence with, with that particular aspect. Um, with stage one, so mini golf, is there increased advertising that's envisaged as part of the delivery of that essentially new service? And is that something that's factored into the cost at the moment? Or? Yeah, so um, at the moment, what we've got is some high level feasibilities that have been done to work out the projected capital cost estimates and then the projected return on investments. And that's mostly done through benchmarking data. So the concept today is really about gaining feedback on that and basically progressing all of the work that, that you're um, talking along with other elements to bring it back, provide that level of um, understanding into council and seek your views on how we might progress that moving forward. Well, my feedback is it certainly should be progressed. Um, it's, it's very heartening to hear to see the jump in usage. It probably comes a bit of a surprise to a lot of us. Is, have you identified what is the fundamental basis? I mean, COVID people without a job, are they playing golf again or something? <laughs> <laughs> so um, probably the simplest answer is the, the increases abroad across the different services that are on offer. Uh, we have increased the course quality and I think that the flexible working conditions plays into that. People have got the ability to play golf at different times. Um, probably the important point I'd make is that golf is a sport that is traditionally condensed into really peak times of demand, which is Saturday mornings, um, those types of things, and they're often exclusive to clubs um, and those types of times. So public really do struggle to get into those times. So I think you introduce, introduce a lot of what we have with COVID and that increased flexibility, our course being um, well-placed and very accessible compared to private golf courses, being that we are a public facility. We've just been in the prime position to really capitalise on that additional patronage as a result. Great. Um, and finally, just on that question of saturation, um, is there an issue potentially the ceiling as to the numbers we could accommodate with the golf course in the future? Are we anywhere close to that ceiling? How does it work with a golf course? You basically got people lining up for holes and they have to go away. 
a certain point or where are we with that yes yes and no yes for the south course um that's our more premium course and it is difficult to get around onto that course now we have got the advantage of having three 18 hole golf courses so we do provide the breadth of services i think ideally to capitalize on patronage the idea is to provide a solution over the journey of of golf if you will and start with little young kids entertainment and all about fun moving to the path three to the north course which is a real opportunity for us to invest in that and bring it up to scratch and then to the south course and as a result of doing that you could see more than ninety thousand rounds um ninety thousand rounds at a single facility puts you very high um benchmarked across nationally um to achieve those sorts of rounds for a single facility as most co most courses are single 18 hour courses they can reach nowhere near those types of visitations Thank you. Excuse me, part three, but I didn't know. Yes. Ah, so Councillor Hyde. Sorry. Um, thanks, Chair. Um, I suppose feedback generally on iterative. I don't like iterative. It's my view. Um, uh, first time I saw it come up, didn't like it, still don't like it. Iterative to me means uncertain. And I don't like uncertainty. I don't like uncertainty when we're talking about spending millions of dollars. I would just say, um, uh, I would say if mini golf stacks up, that's fantastic. Um, but I'd really love to see what informs some of the, like you're talking about 90,000 rounds and what have you. Because what I've got from this presentation is, you know, five year average loss of 464. Um, our numbers have gone up what, 40% 40, 40 on average or thereabouts, and we're still making a $40,000 loss. Now, I appreciate you balancing that against, um, you're balancing that. Sorry, I see fire everywhere else. Was that incorrect? That's was $40,000 profit. Yeah. Oh, sorry, okay, $40,000 profit. Still, 40% increase and only $40,000. It's not, you know, we're not, all, we're not all going to the casino on that. Um, so, but that actually segues into my point. I, I don't want to gamble pays money and so um, I think iterative don't really like it I, I think you should have a still a little bit of a vision I appreciate that the previous master planning process may have resulted in some sort of unwieldy um, a dream of, a, of some five-star golf course but um, uh, but I, I still want to see the, the thought process that okay we start with mini golf at one point Five million, we think it will often is, and if that's successful, then we'll go in, you know, in these sorts of directions. Um, uh, so, but I still want to see some fundamentals underlying that, because at the moment, a forty minute moment, we see a forty percent increase again on top of that, and if it's only forty k, then I can't really justify it. And I also do think, um, Deputy Lord Mayor, about you know Green Hills Adventure Park, which is no longer with us, you know, mini golf icon. Um, is there not already a mini golf line? I don't know. I haven't really played mini golf in a long, long time. If the market research shows that it's there, then willing to look at it if, if, the, if the fundamentals of the number question is right. But yeah, just I'm really caution about um, how we go about doing it. Councillor Mackey. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, through you. In uh, let's just use this is maybe ancient history, and I welcome being being updated. I, I remember twenty odd years ago that there was a pretty high, an unquantified but expected fairly high number of people who access our golf course and do not pay um, their their dues. Do we have any information regarding that and the potential for enforcement? actually helping to, to improve the balance uh, of the financial performance of, of this uh, amenity. Uh, yeah, through the chair, thank you for the question. Um, it's It's been looked at over the years, so you are correct. Um, we have highlighted that it is very challenging to control it, given that it is um, needs to be open and accessible to the public, which is appropriate in the parkland setting. So we have actually improved our ability to police it. Uh, we can now, um, put in controls and go as far as expiating for people to use the greens and tees if we need to. Um, we've increased signage across the course and that's continuing hopefully before the end of the financial year to be improved again. I think it's a valid point. We don't have any quantifiable data on that, unfortunately. Um, a supplementary, uh, supplementary question, um, if I might, through you, Chair. Um, thanks, Sean. The, the, um, have 
the results of the last 12 months been in part a reflection of enforcement and or, or have we yet to commence expiation? And then my follow-up question, further follow-up question is in relation to the PAR 3 proposal, uh, uh, mini, uh, yeah, part, no, mini, golf, mini golf proposal, is that an area that will be vastly more regulated and enforceable and therefore um, not be an invitation to freeloaders? Um, yeah, so in, uh, through the Chair, sorry, for the first part of the question, um, I don't think that a sizable amount of the uplift is in relation to enforcement, um, but we have made those improvements with the idea to try and quantify what that is, so we're in a better position than we were. Um, in regards to the Part 3 section, yes, far more police will be down there. Um, I think the consideration would be in the facility design for mini golf. That's where the rubber hits the road on how we would do that um, respectfully for the setting that it's in, but also achieve the outcomes. It, it's something that you wouldn't want to be um, having damage or free access and those types of things, but equally you certainly wouldn't want fences um, that aren't appropriate. So it's just about balancing that through design. I think there's a good outcome amongst those, those considerations. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Moran? Uh, yes. Uh, the mini golf section, oh, thank you. Mini golf section, I mean, at first blush, it sounds a bit tacky for the pilot lands. Is it going to be done not like down at Magic Mountain? And is it going to be done in a sort of um, sensitive green way, or is it just going to be clowns? And I mean, I love mini golf, but um, is there a design that you can show us for the mini golf? Uh, so the, through the chair, there's no design for the mini golf because we wanted to do this first um, okay. and then come back to that. And also I think that cultural heritage assessment and cultural considerations need to be taken into account for that as well. So the idea here is to get your feedback in basically going and doing that work. Um, what I would say is that we're probably not talking about uh, an adventure land themed yeah. mini golf here. These are generally, there's quite a few across um, Australia. They are more miniature 18 hole golf courses, okay. yeah, well, that, my, my... you know, grassy. Stuff. Okay, well, my, my uh, keenness on that would be um, completely uh, dependent on the design. Uh, the driving range, I notice, has moved from near the Aquatic Centre down parallel to uh, Memorial Drive, um, where it's just uh, wall to wall garner, relics, and grey uh, and uh, artifacts that we kept waiting. That, that's something to look out for. Will that involve fencing? Uh, through the chair, so um, in relation to coming around moving, um, I'm not aware of, of where, where that information is coming from, so um, I can't help with that one. But um, in regards to the driving range design, yes, um, obviously the driving range can be um, can be dangerous and needs to be appropriately lit and appropriately fenced. So um, a huge amount of consideration around siting for me would absolutely be dependent on how appropriate it is in the location in which you're siting it. Um, yeah. So across Wall Memorial Drive, large fencing, you can see that being some issues. Because we encourage um, bypasses to the western suburb down down Memorial, um, Memorial Drive there. So uh, where, where we got that other, last time we sat down with the master plan, it was up by the aquatic centre, which I suppose would need fencing too. Um, uh, that's that's a worry. To Greg's point about the uh, the policing, um, the people um, that you that do come onto the golf course, don't they? previous councils have decided to take a fairly lenient view of that. It's generally the hackers' course, the north course, and I wouldn't like. I, I take Greg's point of money, but remember the golf course cost. Ex so, so is there some oh, it's a hacker's course. It's called a hacker's course. Um, when you're not a very when you're not a very good golfer, um, and a lot of people park in the streets and take a couple of. And I would hate to see that stop. Um, they're not doing any harm. The good golfers play on the other, um, the north, the the southern course. Um, so over policing, I would argue against. Then it becomes you know you have to be wealthy and belong to a club. I would hate to see that overdone. Um, I, I can't get too much interest in iterative or non-iterative or moving golf courses, um, golf clubs. This must be, I'd say, the 28th um, plan that I've sat down and we've earnestly discussed. If the golf course is now in profit, which it never has before, um, we always just try to break even and present a community service, it's great. Uh, let's fix up the old club room we've got there, which is a heritage listed building. It's very underutilised. 
um, and not talk about putting another building on the parkland, less than interested. It's always a question, but it's just a lynch here. Um, is Justin still here? Do you did the Hame Charlie that took us uh, a review there too? Yeah. What what happened to that? It got into had three returning nines, so we could uh, mm -hmm. golf club in the middle. It's lovely. It never happens because it's so expensive, and also the put right out of your mind of uh, going into a park private public partnership because that will involve enormous fencing because no other insurance company will ever let anybody have what they let us do um, there. So as I said, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but I do have a long memory of what, what the pitfalls were. I and think, um, I'd hate you to um, spend a lot of, lot of time uh, on this. Um, the mini golf, if it's pretty nice, the par, par three is great, they love it. The driving range, we, we imported people to tell us about that. Driving ranges are the most, the only thing that worldwide make profit on a golf course. So I'm not quite sure why we're um, not concentrating that on that more than, uh, than the mini golf and the par three. The driving range is the um, the Asian um, tourists, whenever they come back again, love driving ranges. They don't want to track around uh, in buggies. Um, so could we could we have another breakdown? I don't think Memorial Drive is suitable. One long Strangways Terrace, where the portable one we have now is, is very good. There's only a few residents that don't seem to mind the balls going into it. It's a dead end street. But um, I, I can't get enthusiastic. It's, it's a lovely golf course, and I just think we should tiss up what we've got and not spend too much money. Okay, Tom, you wanted to attack? Yeah, look, thank you, Councillor Moran. I think you, you know, you've you picked a lot of things which are quite relevant. First of all, I was actually party to the Hines Charlie report, I remember it very well, and you, you were spot on. I think what Sean's tried to articulate tonight is we had a draft master plan in front of us, which was very aspirational. Uh, with a very high spend, uh, and I would be saying to council, based on that spend, it's probably not the best spend for a community golf course. Mm -hmm. uh, what we've identified quite clearly is the low hanging fruits, which are, we would regard them as low cost options with a high return. And that does include the existing clubhouse, that does include talking to uh, mini golf, stroke, putt putt, whatever the name is. I've even heard holy moly, which seems to be on TV. Um, what we will be doing is coming back to council in regards to business cases which actually talk to return on investment, which will talk to what 90,000 rounds looks like, which will talk to the profitability of any of the uh, innovative ideas we wish to present to council. But when we looked at the plan, it took us a while to go through it. COVID certainly uh, taught us exactly what we shouldn't be investing in um, and what we actually now believe is you know the likes of the putt putt or mini golf and certain other elements in regards to the clubhouses Council Moran's indicated are ones that are well worthwhile uh, taking on board. Uh, it is important to note is and again about uh, coming back to profitability it is actually performing the best that it ever has performed. And that's not just due to COVID, it's due to business operations and changing the business operations. That's both in the North, South and the Par 3. And that's testament to Sean and the team. So we will be coming back to council with business cases that are well documented, talking to what the rate of return is of any investment council wishes to consider. Councillor Martin, did you speak? Yes, I wanted uh, just to clarify a few things. The last time this came to Council um, was in July 2018. Um, it was one of a number of draft master plans. And on the 24th of July 2018, Council did not adopt it. It deferred it. That is to say, it was still no status whatever. Um, that is correct, isn't it? Yep. Are you presiding uh, member of that is indeed correct, Councillor Martin? So we, we have a report that was not adopted coming back to Council as a recommendation to adopt, that is, to, to give endorsement for the um, first stage, stage one of what was the original report, but it's never been adopted. I, I just don't understand why, why we're doing that. Through you, presiding member, just to respond to Councillor Martin's questions, we're not asking you to adopt the master plan. We're actually, what we're saying is, 
we don't wish to progress with the current master plan based on this cost and also based on how golf is currently traveling what we've done is we've looked at the master plan and looked at what elements we believe is timely to actually progress and as i said the first one would be mini golf which we would present as a separate item yes when we talk to stage one stage two stage three uh, fortunately or unfortunately, stage one does talk to mini golf. So if you confuse that with actually adopting the master plan, we're not. We wish to progress with mini golf, but we wish for council to understand what mini golf will actually do for the golf course. No, I understand, and uh, this is the redacted version of the report that was released, and it says stage one is exactly what you're proposing. That is, new mini golf course redevelop path three driving range. So what you're saying is we've rejected the report but we're adopting stage one. Is, is that correct? Am I understanding that? Through you, presiding member, no, what we've done tonight is to firstly present to the draft master plan with, with the clear intention to say to council that we would not recommend spending the amount of money and the time and effort on that. But what we do recommend is elements within that report. Stage one. Elements within that report, whether I, I'll just call it elements a stage whether it's one two three whatever we, we would actually be saying is we would like to present it to council for consideration um because we actually believe based on what the market uh, intel is telling us the return on investment it actually is worth looking at but I again council would have that consideration understand that so uh, why was it that uh, when it was deferred by the previous council that is to allow uh, research or consultation with the Ghana to take into consideration of relevance to cultural and heritage, cultural and built heritage. Why, why was that not done? But this is coming back to us when the very areas, from my recollection of 2018, were these are the areas that will be impacted, um, or sorry, will have the most impact on cultural and history. For example, the area where it's proposed for the driving range is the old mission area for Ghana people in the city of Adelaide, um, was for quite some time during the early days of settlement. And also that part also contains, and this is why we ask for the report, the hanging tree, which was where all the public executions occurred in the first 30 years of the settlement of the city of Adelaide, and the tree still stands. So why would you bring all this back asking for approval when you haven't done the cultural survey, that would inform whether or not we can go ahead with it. I, that's what I'm puzzled about. Through the chair, um, tonight's just about getting feedback on the process that we'd like to take council through moving forward, which is to look at the future planning and the options. Um, more detail will be included in those options when it comes back to council for consideration. Um, and if you look in the presentation about the background, um, there's detail there about the cultural heritage assessment that was completed. Um, that was a desktop assessment of which we would like to take that through to on-site visits. Um, of course, in order to do those on-site visits, you would need some scope as to exactly which piece we'd be taking forward, which talks back to the master plan being um, quite significant and large, and therefore the cultural heritage assessment past the desktop phase would be across the whole of part one. So I think the intent is to, to come back um, with further detail around the, the plan and which phases we think would be independent from a decision perspective you know it's very challenging with that plan i made mention to the fact that once you get going it's very hard to stop and so we'd be looking for pieces of the puzzle i guess essentially that the council could consider in isolation and look at the cultural impacts of each of those hopefully in isolation that would be the ideal situation um, and if we could just provide some um, cautionary comment i guess around the um, confidentiality of the council decision what was released so what has been released to enable tonight's conversation to be in public, all of the information that was released is presented inside the slide. So I just caution any commentary around the things that were included in those council meetings that are still, to my understanding, remain in confidence. Okay, well, look, uh, um, let me just say two things. Uh, and uh, the first is a question to the administration. Would it be possible that before we start talking about um, turning up land, and the desirability of that, that we do the consultation with the Ghana people first. Yeah, no, I understand. I, I um, think, um, I'm asking, I'm yeah, asking for administration if they will do that. Uh, it doesn't require a response, I'm just asking that that happens. 
And the second point uh, to that, um, first statement, I have not released any detail um, that is um, not on the public record. This is the redacted version of the report that was released and what I've been reading from is the captions that remained on the redacted version. Here is the full report, the confidential one, and it, it explains everything. It has everything from the modelling, the financial costs, the number of rounds anticipated, um, where they're linked and how they're linked. Why isn't this being presented to the elected members? It, it, this would actually tell the whole story about the progress and touch on things like the golf clubhouse and the parking. If members had this, they could actually understand what's under discussion. Through you, presiding member, thank you very much for the question, Councillor Martin. Uh, the reason being is we wanted to bring back information in public. We're always happy to bring back to council the master plan. However, as I uh, indicated at the very start, is our recommendation would not be to spend 50 to 60 million. So by saying that, in the first essence is the master plan in its fullest is probably not relevant. What we believe is that to spend money, there's certain characteristics or certain elements that we need to spend on to actually increase revenue and visitation. You will see on the next committee meeting as part of the reports in regards to golf, how Sean and the team have shaped golf in regards to actually lifting that visitation. That will actually give you an insight in regards to why we want to do things like this. But Councillor, I'm happy to provide that in confidence to the report. But what I'm saying is our recommendation would be not to spend 50 to 60 million. That's what we're saying. Uh, look, I thank you for that. And I'm not suggesting that Council should. But may I ask, um, since each of the chapters and stages are linked in the GHD Woodward uh, Graham Marsh reports, that the whole thing be released so that members can actually see the total context, even though the first stage is the only one you're recommending. Through you, presiding member, we haven't, what we suggested is the first stage, or you call the stage, we're actually saying an element, we're trying not to link it to the master plan, we're actually linking it to things that we believe will actually work within golf, that we are seeing working nationally around Australia. Well, I'm happy to present that or provide the council in confidence as it was maintained yep. in confidence. Yeah, no, that would be great. Thank you. Oh, um, uh, may I speak or are we speaking afterwards? Uh, you may speak. Oh, okay. Um, look, uh, I, I find myself increasingly agreeing with Councillor Hyde. Um, iterative processes. Um, much like the uh, you know the east west israel bikeway process are bound to end up in controversy um, and it would be much better i think for all of us to have some idea of the total picture uh, that would lead us to identify and i know it's leading us along the path but if we all went on the same path we might all come to the same conclusion so i would ask that those um, iterative stages be put to one side to allow that fulsome discussion to allow us to reach that conclusion. Thank you. Councillor Matthew. Uh, um, thank you, Chair. Um, and please uh, forgive the slight uh, tongue in cheek -ness. Um I've just looked up uh, iterative in my OED, and um, that's quite interesting. Um, and I also know that the word fulsome is often misused because fulsome actually is a, it's, it's derogatory. It's actually saying less than full. Uh, um, oh, and, and sorry. I know it's often, often I've been guilty of, of the, the same thing. So mm -hmm. I just share that uh, for people's entertainment more than anything else. And the, the word iterative uh, uh, relates to or involves iteration especially of a mathematical or computational process, denoting a grammatical rule that can be applied repeatedly. Um, so we, we probably slightly misuse that, that word as well. I think we all kind of feel we don't have an understanding of it, but uh, that's all I have to say. So through the chair, I will, um, we will definitely call it a facilities development plan. 
Councillor Look, just quite simply, I mean, I'm happy for the administration to go forward and uh, have a look at the plans and uh, do the consultation that they need to do and uh, sort of bring the proposal back. That is based on a profitability and, and a viability, you know, at least we're running square. And, uh, and I can understand that you don't necessarily, you're not interested in the, the big plan which was previously proposed. They so all in there. Lord Mayor. Thank you, Chair. Um, I am very happy to hear that we're not recommending the master plan or spending 50, 60 million. Um, I agree that there's some elements that we need to look at and I would be very happy to progress the concept and detailed planning on the mini golf in particular. Noting, of course, that we do have to do some more work with uh, Ghana Community for Consultation and it will come back to APLA, um, of course, for their consideration as well. Um, also good that we're actually working with Golf Australia. Um, I know that they are obviously um, there at the golf course, but it would be great to get some data from around the country um, to inform that report. And I look forward to uh, seeing what comes back in the business case. Thank you. And well done to you and the team, by the way. Um, you know, moving that barometer from minus 600,000 to plus 40 is no mean feat. And I know there's been a huge amount of work that's gone into improving the course over the last couple of years. Um, so thank you. And if you can pass on our thanks to the team at the golf course as well. No problem. Um, through the chair, just really quickly, um, thank you for the comment, and I would pass that um, straight on to our horticulture team, in particular, who has done a fantastic job, as I mentioned, about the courses increasing, and Dominic and the team down there will be really focused on getting the benefits. So I'll pass those congratulations through to those teams. Yeah, they are fantastic. Thank you, Sean. Um, next item, um, four point two. <laughs> is the aquatic Adelaide Aquatic Centre, Sean, you're here for this one, and I'm going to take it that papers are read and I'll go straight into questions and discussion, if that's okay with everybody. Um, so I'll open up the floor. Anyone would like to speak to this or uh, do you want to put the questions on the screen? So we're asking for members on the views on the preferred location. Um, so, would you like to give feedback to administration with us then? Exactly right. Well, having someone's checked the list. River Bank. No, we're going to move on. Right. No, no. We're going to move on. I said I'd allow. I'm going to I would like to give the administration feedback. Uh, the uh, option four. Um, is the best option. Um, it's canvassed in a roundabout way in the report, but really the size of the location has a lot to do with the makeup of the constituent parts. And if you're talking about considering uh, a 100 metre outdoor pool and an indoor facility of whether that, uh, sorry, 50 metre. 50 metre. Yep. Uh, whether you're considering a 50 metre uh, outdoor pool or a 25 metre indoor or two 25 metre indoors, which the administration raises in the papers, uh, together with water play facilities, um, you really start to be constrained about the space. And that uh, option four, which is the top right hand corner, is the one that allows not only the most flexibility in terms of design, but it also provides opportunity for um, further development or stage development. Um, and uh, unlike the option below, option three, um, retains also that access to public transport routes uh, and a possible tram route. It is the best option in terms of keeping all options open, um, whereas um, the others uh, and the administration has ruled off, redeveloped, ruled out, all but ruled out, rebuilding. Uh, the uh, option two, and I'm having trouble reading them here, option two is too small. Option three runs into size issues as well as uh, residential amenity issues. There are large residential uh, complexes there, whereas option four um, provides the space, 
public transport access, um, but most importantly, loads of parking, um, uh, particularly in neighbouring council areas. Um, uh, Prospect, for example, could handle many cars <laughs> and uh, equally Walkerville could also handle many, many more cars uh, to help us share the load of the dissipations to the area. Um, I, I think it's uh, obvious that that's the best. Anyone else? Councillor Kanon? Um, when I look at, at about the City of Adelaide having to uh, you know, talk about wanting to develop uh, a swimming pool, uh, then I would still consider that it's about bringing people to the city and it being connected to the city and not knowing quite the, the noise and a, a aspect from a swimming centre. Um, you know, but I, I would consider that that uh, proximity to the actual, you know, Adelaide rather than necessarily the other suburbs would be for me more important, and therefore I would consider a, an option three to be more value to me, simply because it does link us a lot better, and uh, it, it is uh, more about the actual city rather than necessarily servicing other people's uh, residents. interested by uh, Councillor Martin's um, discussion. I, I was actually looking at option three, but I think option four may have some merit. And um, the reason is if you actually look at where people are coming from, um, the vast majority are from Prospect, from Port Adelaide Enfield, <coughs> from um, Charles Sturt. And of course, that's the main uh, sort of route that they would take to get there. So there are there would be definite advantages for those um, main catchment areas that are actually going to use the facility. I absolutely agree that we should um, uh, not be rebuilding on the exist existing site and that would also allow us to keep the pool open while the um, new facility would be built, which would be something that we should be hoping to achieve. Um, I do I do query the, uh, for me, uh, I think I'm still querying the size of the facility that we're trying to do um, and the what's within that. So, um, and in terms of whether we need to, to look at a projection of 1.3 visitations or whether we could look at a smaller, slightly smaller facility. Um, uh, given that we have 750,000 and that's been achieved over many, many years, I think a doubling of that is quite an ask. Um, and I would be keen to read really sort of some of the business cases around a facility that may not be quite that um, large and also for the, the cost of creating that facility that we could look at something that might be a lesser spend. Councillor Mackey. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, I'm also interested in um, the option four case that, that Councillor Martin just put. Um, as you're all aware, you know, my, my initial, my initial you know, idea was a central city location, but I understand and accept that, that that was not accepted by a majority. Therefore, if we're talking about the need to redevelop, and I think it's fairly clear we do need to redevelop, um, that um, option four presents the, the least potential land use conflict between the change of land use in the parklands and the residential amenity uh, abutting button terrace. Um, and the public transport routes that uh, Councillor Martin highlighted um, as well, uh, are very interesting. Now, uh, notwithstanding that we have long-term lease arrangements with Blackfriars College on playing grounds there, and that will need to be would need to be very sensitively um, uh, uh, handled. Um, I, 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 I'm also glad to read, and I know that we're talking about the location primarily rather than the activity mix, but I, I am hardened to see in the commentary that um, the detailed feasibility study will also consider an indoor 50 metre pool option um, so that we have a comprehensive understanding of the options and ensure we're prepared should the state or federal governments be prepared to uh, tip in because 
Um, my understanding um, is that the adjoining uh, councils, their, their, their willingness to support uh, in treatment, treating with the um, Commonwealth or the state is actually contingent upon a, a 50 metre indoor um, pool being part of the mix because of the enhanced amenity that it offers to their, their communities. So um, option four presents uh, a, an interesting potential ability to have that uh, uh, taken into account. Can I make some comments? Um, I, I option two a no, option one and option five are a no. Um, I see what uh, Councillor Martin's proposing for option four. I get that. Um, it would be great for the uh, surrounding councils that benefit from that having it there would contribute to it, but you know it's another conversation. Um, option three or option four, uh, either one would suit me. Um, would, I would prefer um, option three, considering that the public transport is right there. I understand the concerns of uh, Barton, um, Barton Terrace, the residents there, um, with the structure being built. Uh, but part of it is commercial, and a lot of it is um, a, unit, a unit block there as well, um, So, uh, which is very well set in. Um, but also the design would probably actually um, make it look quite uh, depending on the design of the of the of the centre, will actually lift up that area, um, and it won't um, you know it won't deter from the residents. I would think, but you know, hey, they would have to agree to that. So either option three or option four appeal to me um, if that helps in any way. Tom, yeah. Through you, presiding member, maybe if I could assist uh, elected members. Uh, option four, thank you, Councillor Martin. It, it makes a lot of sense. Um, what, what I would say is uh, contained within the feasibility and the costing, it, you know, it, it might be advantageous to actually just include option four and option three for review. You still ultimately to make the decision and that way it will give you the opportunity to make uh, the best decision based on access, egress and what it actually does. Just an option three, just in, just in summary, is option three was considered one was it had the least amount of impact in regards to the playing fields. So that was important in regards to continuity. To also bring that back to the heart of O'Connell Street, and so that linkage. However, I do note with option four and what that would bring, but there is some complications in regards to getting vehicles in and out because of the busy intersection, but we're happy to come back and present those options to you. I think that's probably the best way. So the next steps would, for us is we'll, we'll get on with the feasibility um, to do the work and then we'll bring it back to council. Great idea. Time frame we're probably showing, uh, what do you think from Warren's perspective? Through the chair, yes, I would say probably we're looking at eight to 12 weeks to be coming back to council, um, but I'll need to go back through with the team the recommendation uh, I guess from the feedback tonight is different to what we were planning with options two and three. So any work that we have progress, we just need to redo an option four um, and have a look at the associated impacts. So um, broad time frames, please. Councillor Martin. Yeah, just a question. Can I ask, and I know the administration is applying its full effort to all of this, but can I just say that we may face a federal election in the second half of the year? So that is a real driver. Really? You don't think so? Okay. Well, it's in God's hands, as somebody else would say. It's in God's hands, as somebody else Thank you. Um, item 4.3. So, item 4.3, um, Christmas Festival Action Plan, we have Noni and Christine here. I'm going to go take the papers as read. Or all happy with that, yeah. members? Yeah. So we'll go straight to the questions if we can. Thank you. So, what are the council members' views on the proposed outcomes and key deliveries for the inclusion of the final Christmas festival action plan for 2021 and 2024? Now, um, any feedback, Councillor Mackey? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I'm by and large comfortable with, with everything. I, I just want to make a special plea and, and um, some who read the papers will understand I have become a latter day convert to saving the big things, big Scotty. Um, 
We have a big Santa, a heritage uh, object, which former council, uh, Lord Mayor Hazy, um, uh, in order to prevent it being lost to the city, farmed over, off to the Adelaide Central Market Authority. Now I understand that was not brought to um, bought out uh, in Christmas uh, just past because of the cost, um, and I would hate to see Big Santa lost. Uh, he is an icon uh, of um, South Australia's and Adelaide's Christmas heritage. Tom. Through you, Presiding Member, um, thank you very much in regards to Big Santa, and I'm referring to the object, not me. Um, from, from my perspective, and uh, the advice I've been given by ACMA, as you're aware, Councillor, it was donated by uh, David Jones to, and it was the previous Lord Mayor who worked hard and through the chair of ACMA. To, to receive that. The reason why David Jones actually were happy to move it on was purely based on cost. That's the installation and the maintenance upkeep of Big Santa. What's facing ECMA at the minute is exactly the same thing in regards to cost and installation. Uh, it's estimated that uh, it would cost approximately close to $40,000 to, to bring a smile to Santa's face and uh, to do what it needs to do. Um, but it's somewhere in the, the region of around about $90,000 to, to make good and do what they need to do. And let's get it up on that, on that building. I believe that ACMA, uh, for, first and foremost, they, they are probably reluctant to do that because they don't know where their role is in regards to Big Santa and they inherited it. But I would say that's a question for council moving forward. It certainly requires a significant amount of work. Um, we're not disposing of it, we just have it, but it's stored externally at a, at a cost for ACMA. Uh, I think it's approximately $10,000. Um, so the, it comes with a cost to have Santa on the side of the building, and, and that's the information ACMA have provided me. Just I think what Councillor Mackey, yeah. sorry, just to close out, I think what we heard you say, Councillor Mackey, is that you're keen for us to keep that um, in the action plan, and yes. certainly we can um, have another look at it. But my understanding was the quality of the actual asset itself isn't good, so that was, um, was there any um, condition asset data? that have been provided more recently than a couple of years ago. And um, if so, can you share that so that council members understand the quality of the asset? Through, through your presiding member, uh, ACMA undertook a, a piece of work in regards to going back to the, the fabrication in regards to fiberglass to understand the, the current condition. It is uh, significantly uh, eroded in regards to not only the painting, but the fiberglass actual framework itself. It's in three parts. And as I say, the quotes that they got through was uh, circa high at mid thirties to forty thousand dollars to to maintain, or to get Big Santa up to a fit status, and then actually the costs associated, which are huge, to actually put Big Santa onto the side on Federal Hall every year. Every year. Um, thank but we'll incorporate that. No, thank you uh, through you again, Chair. Uh, I, I would be very, very interested to see those reports. I'm not sure if they constitute a conservation study, uh, I, 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 but I would be very, very interested. I think just as the John Martin's Christmas pageant, which became the David Jones Christmas pageant, which is now the Christmas pageant, um, uh, is, as, uh, is iconic to Adelaide's uh, festive season. Uh, um, I also believe that Big Santa uh, is worth more than retiring off to the corner of, of a warehouse. And, and uh, he looked very, very handsome up there. And whether we're talking in the future about a facsimile Big Santa that will be, uh, uh, to all intents and purposes, um, uh, a reproduction that wouldn't be the only iconic object that we now enjoy a reproduction of. Um, and I think it's central to our identity and it's certainly a, uh, an iconic uh, festive season landmark. See you. Um, and and Councillor Mackey, can I just ask, is there anything then within the action plan that we could deprioritise to sort of, oh, so it. that, Don't you know, so we'll Santa, yeah. Santa, we'll is there we'll another that something else? That's something well. else that you, you saw in there that you weren't so excited by. Um, um, that would help us then when it comes to how we might plan prioritise. Um, uh, through you, Chair, look, I haven't considered that, but I, I understand the question and I'm happy to take that.
on notice uh, and, uh, and and engage with uh, uh, with you in exploring that. Lord Mayor. Um, thank you, Chair. I uh, I thought there was some really great stuff in here. I I love Christmas, as you know, and um, and I do actually agree. And Deputy Lord Mayor and I've spoken about this a few times. The more that we can sort of focus Christmas and the Christmas experience mm -hmm. in the city, the more people are going to come into the city of Adelaide and do what they need to do for Christmas, whether that's you know, shopping or food or, or um, buying gifts. And so I, I do actually think um, a concerted effort, particularly in light of the information that we heard earlier, which was about the shift to online and digital. We need to really try and counteract that and give them lots of reasons to come in. I particularly love the tree. I know that that's um, a tricky one and it's expensive, but um, I do. I constantly see people filming themselves with the tree, and um, social media apparently is the work of the devil, according to Scott Morrison. But um, which has just come out on, um, on the social media. Social media. Yeah, no, <laughs> social media is the uh, work of the devil. But um, I do actually see huge amounts of um, families photographing themselves. Um, I would be very keen for us to have a look whether there's any way um, that we could re-look at the virtual reality work that was done a few years, augmented reality, sorry, augmented reality work that was done a few years ago. Mm. Anne's not here, I think she's the only one that might remember yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so uh, where you could use your phone or your iPad and you would see reindeers at bus stops or Santa going over the town hall or whatever, and it was probably a little bit early to be perfectly honest, we were probably a little bit at the front of a curve. Whereas now, I think if we re-looked at that, um, at, I don't know any young kids that don't have a phone or an iPad or, um, so it is one of those things I think it would be a great take up. In. Does that mean, I, I don't understand what that is, so. Um, so, um, so it's not actually people physically coming no, into the city. No, yeah, yeah, no, they have to come in. Oh, so, no, oh, would you yeah, mind yeah, just, yeah. Yeah. Through the chair, I'll try my best. You know, I'm not very technically minded. Um, so basically, it's an app that you have on your tablet or your phone, and then in various locations around the city, there were these little um, decals or stickers that you would put on the building or on the footpath, and then you would um, hold your tablet or your phone, and a whole um, elf or Father Christmas would all come to life. On so your, you could look at it like this on your screen and you yeah. see Father Christmas flying in the sleigh or um, a, there was, I don't know, there was a reindeer at a bus stop yeah. and there was elves putting presents under a tree. Yeah. And they were located um, between the amazing. Central Market through to North Terrace and a few along North Terrace as well. Um, the, the other comment I was just going to make, um, where um, I'm also aware that there's a lot of work that needs to be done on Santa if we're going to bring him back, but um, whether it's uh, we could have a conversation with the um, set builders that work, um, that do the stage work for State Theatre or whatever, they can be quite creative. Um, they can make uh, things look like stone walls that are made out of, what's that? Polystyrene, whatever, polystyrene, whatever. Um, I don't think they use polystyrene. Sorry. Um, Foam, maybe. <laughs> we have well, you, yes. we could absolutely, but but um, you know these are people that create uh, sets for a living, and I think that perhaps um, they might be a good resource to tap into. Um, equally with um, the AR, um, that's come such a long way, and we've got. Um, enormous amount of people working in creative industries in Adelaide at the moment, so that would be my feedback. Thank you. Councillor Martin. Oh, just a, a quick question in relation to Santa uh, that uh, Councillor Mackey raised. Do we have any idea what a facsimile would cost? I mean, you, we're talking $90,000 to repair the one that's there. No, it's we don't? Three, three presiding member. Uh, you could probably go uh, two, three, four times the cost. They are not cheap. We, we've got some uh, 
think well, we've done some of similar sorts of work in London Mall, and uh, we've done that Santa's and Coast Box and whatever. They are not cheap to get done because there's only one or two providers within South Australia who does that sort of work. Um, so we pay a lot of money for it. Okay. Um, and, uh, yeah, um, and it would be nice to have um, an environmentally sound place in only too. Um, but uh, by the by, um, the only uh, comment I have about the, the Christmas plan is um, we just need to do more promotion about what we do. I mean, last year um, I had ratepayers complaining that they didn't know that there were choirs that the council had organised. And if they'd done them, they'd have come along. Why don't you tell us about it? We just need more promotion about everything that we do. Councillor Donald? Thanks, Chair, uh, through you. Um, with the incentive grants last year, were they all taken up? And, and was there a large over application? Through the chair, uh, yes, councillor, they all were taken up and um, it was oversubscribed. Um, however, in saying that the um, applicants that qualified were probably the cream of the crop. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, it was well received. And the feedback that we've received is that all of those that participated um, found it really beneficial and it did increase visitation to those parts of the city where those activities were held. And with the... Um uh, grant criteria, it, was there an element or will there be an element this year that looks at the applications across the city and the distribution across the city? Uh, through the chair, yes, there will be. Thanks. Councillor Pernal? I mean, just simple. Um, I mean, uh, I thought it was a really lovely plan. Thank you very much. But, uh, um, and I think the, the main thing is that everything we're doing is about getting people out of their cars and in, into our streets. And certainly promotion is one of my big things anyway, to ensure that uh, we let everybody know what we're doing because that's how we get them into the city. So otherwise, fantastic, thank you. Anyone else? No? Uh, I'm just gonna just provide a little bit of feedback. Um, I think I hunt, hunted hunting for Santa last week with Tom. Um, I too miss uh, having Santa so we can work out ways to bring him back. That will be great. Um, he's, the thing about, um, if you remember Christmas in the city when I was little, it was just big, it was bold, it was, it was just full on. And I think um, a lot has been lost um, in the sense of like Santa not being there um, and uh, the decorations are a lot, lot different back then as what they are now. But if we could move forward, like Lord Mayor's suggestion was sounded fantastic and to bring an experience, um, that experience back into the city um, in a big way. We're losing the brewery lights, we're, we're, we've lost Santa. I mean, I would hate to think that we're losing um, the Christmas experience, but also spread it out, um, you know, with lights um, and the Christmas festivities. And I know that we've had those grants that as Councillor Donovan mentioned, um, but if we could do um, a little bit more in communicating things out for the public would be great. Um, uh, I think a lot of that was lost, um, but I think overall, if we could just ramp it up a bit, that would be great. Yeah. Tom? Uh, through you, Presiding Member. Just one, uh, just seeking your views. There's one item that we have to close off on just quickly. What are your views on certain elements of Christmas being sponsored by a third party? Uh, uh, members, would you like to? Some Christmas elves. Yes, I think that's a splendid idea. Um, I, um, I'll be happy to visit that. Um, yeah, you just don't want it to be crass and overtly mm -hmm. sponsored. You've got to be really mindful of that. Uh, Optus logos on the elves, you know. Yeah. <laughs> what about the church? <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> I think you could do some elements that way. Yeah. yeah. Potentially at certain events. It would be a bit odd to have Christmas sponsored by. Mm -hmm. You might have someone that wants to sponsor Santa. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you everyone. Um, so close of the meeting, thank you.